In a recent video, I took apart a solar streetlight and it was kind of, it was interesting. It seemed to have a very promising solar panel and the cell inside was enormous. Although it turns out that it's not got a huge capacity because it's a different type of battery technology, but that's one of the main subjects of this video. I took the solar panel outside and keep in mind this is winter, it was a cloudy day, not great sunshine. I managed to get about 70 milliamps out of this panel, but I know that in the peak of summer it would easily put out something like 500 milliamps or more. So the solar panel is probably okay, but it does mean that if you were using this light in a sort of, uh, well, uh, non-brilliantly sunny place, then you're not going to get much capacity on that solar street light. Uh, particularly when you need the light, which is the longest nights are also the most overcast here in uh, the Isle of Man, so it isn't an ideal situation. But the other option there is to scale the solar panel up ridiculously and then it just gets, you know, you'd have to go really huge to get any decent amount of proper energy out on a cloudy day. The other thing that was most interesting was this cell, which it turned out to be a lithium iron phosphate cell. And uh, if you compare it, this one has about 3.2 amp hour when I tested it. This one claims about 3.1 and you look at the size of them. And this one is just enormous compared to this. But the differences are that while this one is less efficient in space and it's probably not really what you might call an optimal cell, typically these you'd expect capacity of about 5 amp hour, but in this case it's just a basic cell, so it's only 3 amp hour. The main feature here is that... Uh, it is this lithium iron phosphate which has some major advantages over traditional lithium iron batteries. They're the ones that are used in electric cars and they're not just used in electric cars because they're relatively safer. Um, I mean, obviously, Rich Rebuild's little incident recently with uh, uh, Tesla battery packs put into a little a Disney car thing which then exploded in flames. Uh, they kind of uh, show that, you know, it, although it's safer, it's got a less combustible electrolyte, the, they still contain a lot of energy. Uh, I shall put a link to that video down below. It's incredibly, it's just to see the batteries going up and the way they're reacting is just hilarious, but also educational. So let's take a look at this cell and the technology behind it. So it is a lithium iron phosphate. Now, the this is often described as Li, Fe, Po, four small four, and that means lithium, uh, iron, phosphate. And by the Po four is actually an atom of phosph uh, phosphorus with four oxygen atoms attached to it. No real reason to show you that. You don't really need to know that. It's just useful to know why it says Po four. This is iron. And this is lithium. And that's phosphate. Uh, it's notable that uh, phosphorus in its native form is quite hard to find. It's, it's usually found in this sort of form because it, it does combust on its own. It's quite unstable in its own, uh, on a, in its raw form. The other name for this, and in a sense, I used to call these lithium ferrous phosphate just because well, the FE always thought ferrous and ferrous is iron. It turns out that they are also called lithium ferrophosphate cells. Um, it's just the other name for them. And the notable things is that whereas this lithium cell here, the ones we're used to, typically says about 3.7 volts, and it will actually go from 4.2 volts at the top of charge down to about 3 volts when it's almost depleted. The, these ones are actually usually rated 3.2 volts. This is part of the uh, lesser capacity aspect of it. And they start, typically the upper limit will be about 3.6 volts, absolute maximum 3.65, and the lower voltage threshold will typically be about 2.5, or the, I think the protection probably kicks in closer to probably about 2 if, if the actual chip has to cut in here. To test that battery, I plugged it into my usual charging arrangement for one of these cells, but I did so knowing that if it turned out to be the different technology, the little protection board in here would cut out, and that's exactly what happened long before this, this reached its 4.2 volt cutoff voltage, this cutoff here. And because uh, the protection was kicking in doubt, uh, just as the, the uh, voltage stabilised in it, it just kept, sort of after a while, it just kept cycling the on and off the little green and red LED in this as it topped it up. I'm kind of interested to see what chips in here. 
Uh, is there anything else worth mentioning? Yes, there is. One of the most important features about why this is used in a streetlight. This standard lithium cell is quite an aggressive lithium technology inside, and it's rated for about a thousand charge discharge cycles before it sort of re starts reducing. And if you've got a mobile phone, you've had it for quite a while, you'll notice the capacity gradually reduces. That's excluding the updates that the manufacturers push out that also eat the battery. But over time, you'll notice that the battery capacity is lower and lower and you get less runtime. And that's because these age quite quickly. Even in storage over a year, they'll lose their capacity. I think that's why we get a lot of the cells um, with cheapy Chinese products that come with sub one amp hour versions of these. It's because they, they started off low and then they've depleted over time. They also at degrade. They don't like being stored in a fully charged state. That's why you generally discharge them about 3.6, 3.7 volts, which is the point at which the lithium is evenly distributed between the two electrodes. And because it's less concentrated, it uh, kind of it makes the cell more stable. Interestingly, when this one's fully charged, the lithium ions that move across, not all of them leave the, the electrode that uh, as you're charging it, the it ends up with uh, most of the lithium ions on one side, but a good chunk are left on the other. With this technology, apparently almost every single lithium ion transfers across in the process of charging it. Um, other things worth of note, yes. Okay, so this is a super stable technology. It lasts estimated about 10 more years. In one year, this if an equal cell capacity size of the lithium iron phosphate would actually exceed the capacity of a similar uh, lithium ion cell, the conventional lithium ion cell. And the charge discharge cycles, at least 2000, but potentially depending on the technology and gradually reduced capacity over time, they're looking at 5000 or more. And when you think streetlight, every single day it's getting charged and discharged, that's 365 cycles a year. So that is going to extend the life of it considerably. Uh, noting again in that light, this was in an area which was vented, so I wonder if how waterproof this is. I wonder if condensation inside could have wicked in here and damaged the charge uh, protection circuitry. Don't know. I want to see what's inside this, because normally it would be a uh, DW01 protection chip, but in this case it probably isn't, unless they've got a version of that optimised for this technology, because of the different voltage. So let me think if I covered everything. I've covered everything here about these rather amazing lithium batteries. I, I think Tesla uses these. I just said that with the rich rebuild. So let's uh, grab my uh, lithium containment pie dish, the explosion containment pie dishes handy. Let's uh, start cutting into this and get some of the sleeving off and try and defuse this. Unfortunately, this is fully charged right up to the hilt. Which is bad news when you're cutting it open, generally speaking. If it gets hot suddenly, I have the contingency plan of grabbing a pair of snips and trying to cut the metal strip just in case uh, it does go thermonuclear on me. I'm also being careful not to short out the circuit board here. So there is one of the, I might just cut that metal strap here. Honestly, it feels like you're defusing a bomb. It's quite scary, but in a good way. That little edge, there we go. That should make it much more stable. So I'm going to carefully slit. I'll get down closer here so you can watch me have a terrible accident. I'm going to carefully slit the heat shrink along here. Slicing into the insulation of these wires in the process probably. And then coming along the back of the circuit board, hoping there's nothing on the circuit board on the side. I don't think there is. I think it's just connections. And then peeling that back. And hopefully this will give us access to see what chip it is under there. I can see it's a standard arrangement. It looks like the DW1 style chip. But with the couple of big MOSFETs. So there's the chip we're really interested in here. This is where I... We'll take a look through a magnifying glass at it. It's called G112 ICM 
2112. And then underneath it says CB22. Can you see that at all? Let's see if I can actually focus down onto this chip. Are you going to be able to see that? It is really... Mm, no, it's tiny, isn't it? And it's getting the light right. Okay, well, I'm going to investigate that chip, so I'll be back in a jiffy. It is a completely standard chip. This one is by Hikon, I think it is. And they seem to be made by different manufacturers, but to all intents and purposes, when you see the 100 ohm resistor and the capacitor there for decoupling a noise from the battery, and we've got the two MOSFETs and the little sense resistor that detects a, a, a high voltage across these, which detects the overload, basically. It, uh, it's identical to DW01, uh, the sort of general layout of it. And these are available in a sort of range of uh, voltage ratings. This, the cutoff voltage could be 3.65 or it could be 3.7. And also at the bottom end of the range, but the over discharge, it's uh, somewhere in the region of 2.5 or downwards from that. But it is more or less just like the DW01. It's quite good that it's got a completely different number, though. That keeps them well differentiated. Uh, other things worth mentioning. In the past, I was like pondering, why do they have two MOSFETs? And it just makes sense now. It's because of the uh, diode that's built in this. In the general construction of a MOSFET, you've got effectively a diode is formed as part of that construction. And if you didn't have two MOSFETs, it needs to uh, be able to control current flowing in and out of the lithium cell. So if they only tried that with a single diode, a MOSFET, then there'd be a diode sort of allowing current to flow in one of those directions. It wouldn't block it completely. So by using the two MOSFETs, which are built into the one package, it blocks in both directions. It, the diodes can't have an effect there. They can't bypass them because in the, in the sense that if the current was flowing in this way, where it would bypass that diode, it would then be blocked by this diode and this MOSFET. It's just the way that works. But uh, that's quite neat. So um, the... Lithium iron phosphate sound. I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm going to have to play about with this. This is quite interesting. It is that much more stable, long life technology with that little extra protection board on it as well for that uh, for charge and over discharge protection. So that's going to be quite useful, particularly given that how long these last. That's going to be well worth playing about with. And uh, once summer comes back, I'll do a proper test in that solar cell, that solar panel. Although ultimately, as I say, it doesn't really matter because in the winter, when you need the light, that's when you're not going to get it. It does make me think of, uh, we tried, we considered doing solar powered Christmas lights in, on, in the Glasgow city centre a long time ago. And just to experiment, I brought in a solar panel and held it. I wanted to see what it actually and try, try it in different places in Glasgow. So I basically had a meter and a solar panel and I just went to the middle of George Square and it was terrible. And then I went over to some of the streets that were surrounded by buildings. And again, it was terrible in the winter. It was too overcast with cloud and too dull with no direct sight of the sun. So um, it wasn't going to work. That's just the peril of solar panels. They don't put out much power when you need them most. But yeah, interesting stuff, particularly finding that chip and the way it is that equivalent to the DW01, but for the different battery technology.